Hi, so uh, I'm Dominic Slomurphy. I work for the EPCC, as I said, and uh, I'm a member of the Archer CSE team here. Uh, just before we get started, just a reminder that this will be recorded and put up online later for everyone to view. Uh, oh, and feel free to ask questions in the chat as we go along. I have some people here assisting me who will hopefully answer the questions or let me know if, if you need any input. So uh, in this webinar, we'll be talking about how uh, best to transfer data to and from the RDF. That's how to archive it beforehand and the relative pros and cons of some of the copying utilities available. Uh, hopefully, you'll come away with an idea of how to avoid some of the more common bottlenecks here and there. Okay. So first, just a brief reminder of the file systems on Archer. We've got slash home, which is the default file system you see on first login. It's uh, where you keep important files like source code, etc., as it's fully backed up and recoverable. It's a network file system available on both the login and service nodes. And uh, service nodes, I mean things like the mum job launcher nodes. Importantly, not the compute nodes. Uh, for those, we have slash work, which is a scratch space using the Luster, that's Linux cluster file system. It's available to all nodes and is used for holding all files necessary for a job, so input files, job, sc job scripts, generally that sort of thing. Um, note that it's not backed up at all, so no data can be recovered on loss. Finally, we have the RDF. It's a separate facility for the long-term archiving of data and results. It's backed up in case of fire, but accidental deletion recovery is not supported. It uses the IBM general parallel file system and is mounted on the login and serial nodes. So where exactly your RDF space is mounted on a login node is dependent on your funding body. Generally, projects starting with an E are in slash EPSERC, and those starting with an N are in slash NERC, and the others are in slash general. I think there's a handful of exceptions to this, but uh, you'll know if you're one of those. Uh, as an alternate way to access the RDF, uh, rather than going through a login node, uh, we have these, these transfer nodes, or the DTNs. Um, they are specialized machines, so you'll generally have a, a better time uh, transferring to, through them than through a login node if you're acting remotely. So. Right, so we've mentioned we'll be looking at some of these archiving options, but first, why? Why would you want to actually use them on any of your files? Well, the big motivation is performance. A single file will need fewer metadata operations to access than a group of files taking up the same size. And uh, by metadata operations, I mean things like uh, file permissions, creation date, name, owner. Generally, anything about a file other than the actual data itself is a metadata, a little bit of metadata. And uh, the more files you have, the more requests you have to make for this info, and it can bottleneck really quite badly. So. Just as an example here, looking at 23 gigabytes of data that um, is made up from around 13,000, 32 kilobytes, 5 megabyte files, uh, it took me around one hour to copy that from my uh, workspace to the RDF. Whereas, if we had put the same data in an archive and copied that across, see, it takes about three minutes. So that's around 20 times faster. Of course, these times are very variable due to the file system contention and that sort of thing. And uh, note, there is some initial overhead in the time it takes to create the actual archive. But you'll need to do that once per set of data, and then it'll speed things up in all subsequent accesses. Um, Ah, yes. If you do have an archiving or copying task that's going to take a long time, we do ask that you make use of the serial nodes wrapped up in a job and submit it to the post-processing queue. Uh, this is just to avoid hitting the login nodes too hard and provoking a, a nasty response from our systems team. Right. So 
So the archiving utilities we'll be looking at are TAR, uh, CPIO, and ZIP. Uh, they each have their pros and cons, but it's mostly down to personal preference, which one you use. And generally, I just stick with TAR because it's the most common in the Linux world, but uh, I don't have any compelling technical reasons for that choice. Uh, it's recommended that you forego compressing archives for the RDF as this adds additional overhead to the creation and extraction processes. Uh, but of course, a smaller file will take less time to copy about, so there's a trade-off there. Uh, well, uh, although, unless you get an extremely good compression ratio, uh, you'll likely be better skipping gzip or uh, whatever compression methods the archiving utility provides. Uh, you'll be familiar with TAR if you've worked with Linux or any other Unix-like systems. It's an extremely popular way to package up source codes and other files for distribution. I'll just go through some of the more common options to use when turning things up for the RDF. So we have dash C, which just tells the program to create a new archive. Dash V, which verbosely lists each file as it's processed. Uh, you probably don't want to do this if you have lots of files, as the I.O. time from printing each file name to the console could become significant. Uh, this dash capital W, which verifies the archive after writing, uh, which does add a fair amount of overhead to the creation process, but it will give you a bit more extra confidence that what you've written is actually correct. And uh, dash L confirms uh, all file hard links are included in the archive, so that will prompt a warning uh, if you include a file with a hard link but miss the actual link itself. So this can be useful if you want to use those and you want an exact reproduction of your file arrangement. And finally, there's dash F, which is, uh, just tells it to use an archive file, because otherwise it will print your data to standard output by default. So you put that all together and you just get this example command at the bottom, which archives a directory my data in tar format. So to get your data back out from an archive, you'd use dash x for extract, uh, again with dash f to specify a file name. Uh, if you already have an existing Tor archive and want to check it against a set of data, you can use dash d to perform a comparison. And uh, here's the sort of output you would see if it spotted any problems. So we have a damaged file in the archive compared against the My Data folder containing a good version of the archive of the data, and the archive reports that uh, the modification time is different and the size differs. So you can know that uh, your file is not good. Oh, um, do note that you do need to have an existing unarchived set of data to go with the tar file. Uh, the other utilities will look at. It can store file checksums within the archive, but TAR cannot do that. So you do need the, the files, a good, a gold version to compare against. Of course, you could use something like MD5SUM or another hashing algorithm to manually produce checksums of your files, and then you could store them along with the archive somewhere in a text file, for example. Then you could verify each file you extract by recalculating the sum and comparing it with its entry in the text file. But that's probably too much work, especially when you could choose something like CPIO. Uh, it's less common than TAR, but it's no less supported. So standard options for creating a, a CPIO file are dash O. It's again to help to create a new archive, aka copy out mode. Uh, dash V to list files as they're processed, which is just as with TAR. And dash H to specify what type of CPIO file you want to create. So I recommend CRC, that's the format you want to use, as it provides the file checksums within the actual archive. And uh, the cost is compatibility with older versions of the CPIO utility, which is not that big of a trade-off. Uh, one slightly fiddly thing about CPIO is that there is no dash R recursive flag. So you can't just give it a directory and have it produce an archive of all files and subfolders. You do need to pipe in a specific list of files to be archived, uh, which can be done fairly easily in combination with the find command, as in the example here. So find will just go through the my data directory, uh, producing a list of 
every file in it. And that gets piped into CPIO, which then uses the options we just described. And uh, note that CPIO does write its stated standard output, so you will need to redirect to capture that in a file. Okay, so extracting is done with the dash I flag, which is uh, also known as copy in mode, the opposite of copy out from before. You'll probably want to use that in combination with dash D, which tells it to create directories and subdirectories as needed. So you can keep the same folder structure as you put into the file. Uh, oh, and similarly, CPIO takes its input from standard in, so you'll need to redirect the file the other direction. Uh, verifying existing archive is easier than with tar, uh, if you use the CRC format, which stores checksums, that is. Uh, you can use copy in mode, dash I, uh, with this flag here, only verify CRC, which skips the actual extraction and gives you a report on the status of your files. Uh, so you, you don't need an unextracted copy of the data to compare against at all. So here we see uh, my data file has been damaged and its current checksum value does not match the stored expected value. Right, uh, so the final utility we'll look at is zip. So it's very widely used and I think the only format out of these three which uh, is supported out of the box on Windows uh, since around version XP. So all current Windows workstations will be able to use this without any additional software. Um, so they've got common options, dash R, which is the recursively archiving directories option. Uh, no need for find as with CPIO. And uh, compression level, which can be a number between zero and nine. Um, I think the default is four or five, but we recommend zero to turn off uh, compression. I'm not sure unless you're a special case. Oh, of, uh, of note, so there's just an example command showing uh, turn, off, uh, turn off compression and recursively create a zip archive of my data. Yeah, of note, uh, zip files don't preserve hard links. So that means if you try and store a 100 megabyte file and a hard link to that file, you'll end up with an archive of give or take around 200 megabytes depending on cluster size and all that sort of thing. Um, this is unlikely to be a problem for most people, but it's something to bear in mind if you do actually make use of hard links at all. That's correct. Right, so it's uh, to turn off, uh, so the, the question was, I'll repeat it for the recording, is uh, why is zero recommended as the compression level? Uh, so the idea to turn off compression is uh, you don't want to end up CPU bound. So if you're storing stuff on the RDF, it's just going to be an archive for your data. You probably don't mind too much about the actual compressed size. Um, so when you do actually compress the uh, the data, your CPU, you, you put in additional processing. So it takes a lot longer to actually create the, the archive itself. So you don't really get much benefit from the compression in terms of uh, sort of IO performance. So you, your disk can be fine, but you'll be limited by your sort of CPU as opposed to your IO. So does that answer the question or? Okay, we've got a confirmation. Thank you very much. Um, right, so moving on. For unzipping, uh, we have, well, unlike the others, it uses a special unzip utility for extracting an archive. Uh, you can just use it as is without any additional flags to unzip my data for simple extraction. Uh, there is a dash T flag for verifying and testing an existing archive. Uh, again, you don't need a copy of the data to compare against. Uh, you also don't need to specify any particular formats on zip creation as zip files will store CRC values by default. And uh, yeah, here's just an example of a zip file successfully passing verification. So just do unzip dash T, skips the extraction, and just gives you a report saying that 
your files are okay and no errors were detected. And it will say in compressed data, even if you choose to forego compression on the zip, on the zip file. So uh, it's just general data, it didn't have to be compressed data. Right, so that brings us to the end of the section on archiving. So now we know how to package data up. Uh, we need to look at the different methods of transfer available to us. So we'll look at three different scenarios. So doing a, a local copy from Archer to the RDF, uh, along with remote transfers over SSH, and uh, again, what your options are for doing very large transfers, so in the order of tens or hundreds of gigabytes. So in the Archer login nodes, uh, the RDF is mounted under slash epsirc slash nerc or slash general. So you can just use your normal file manipulation utilities, so just a normal CP to transfer to the RDF as you would a normal copy between directories. Uh, so that's just CP source destination uh, with dash R if necessary. Um, you can also use rsync with similar syntax. And the difference here is that rsync will not try and copy over files that already exist at the destination. So this could save you some time, except that the, uh, the mirroring process does take uh, a lot of these bottlenecking metadata operations to actually determine if the files at source and destination are the same. So it could slow you down, uh, depending on your actual directory contents. So it's recommended to use rsync when resynchronizing a previously copied directory with large files. Otherwise, you may find you're likely to find it's faster to just copy over the top of the existing files to CP. Uh, all right, okay. I did say rsync mirrors uh, your files. Uh, I should clarify there. One important thing to note is that rsync will not delete files at the destination unless explicitly asked. Uh, so you may find things you remove from your local copy uh, still appear in the mirror even after an rsync. So there are flags to change this behavior which you may or may not want to use as the default could save you some accidental file loss at some point. So remote transfers, so copying, or copying to the RDF over SSH as uh, a remote method, so uh, DTNs should be used, that's the data transfer nodes. Uh, as for utilities, there is SCP or secure copy, which is the SSH analog of standard CP. Uh, the syntax for copy is very similar, except now that your destination will include a, a huge name and domain, or, or it may not if you set up SSH keys a certain way. Um, you can also use rsync for remote copies, so the same utility for both local and remote transfers. Uh, the difference is that you use dash E to specify exactly which remote shell you want to use, so between the remote machine and the RDF it will be SSH. Uh, the thing about SSH is that it is designed for security, designed to connect in a secure way so all your traffic is encrypted. And this is great for security, but it can give you a performance penalty on your transfers. Uh, you can speed things up if you tell it to use faster ciphers. So uh, ARC4 is generally said to be the fastest cipher available in SSH and you can specify that with the dash C option to SCP and uh, the same for rsync. I don't believe our, I don't believe ARC4 is considered strictly insecure at the moment, but it's definitely recognized as weak. Uh, if you do need to transfer things securely, it's probably best to stick with the default. However, if you don't need encryption at all, then uh, you can use something like grid FTP which is a specialized tool designed for very large data transfers, which uses multiple unencrypted socket connections for their high performance. Um, transfers are done with this Globus URL copy utility here. Uh, this is set up, uh, it's already set up and installed on the DTN nodes, but you may need to download the tools on your source machine in order to initiate the transfer. Uh, they're available at globus.org. Uh, I've put a link at the end of the slides when we get there. It's just uh, Googling it. We'll also find you just Globus tools download. Um, 
So Globus URL copy has your general, recursive, and verbose options. But there is a quite a significant difference in how you specify your source and destination files. So you have to give them both in full URL format. So here we have a file colon slash slash the actual file protocol for a local file. And it has a fully qualified path. So they're exactly from root where the file is on the system. Uh, so there's no use of the colon just for your home directory as you might be used to with SCP. Uh, in this example here, I'm using SSH FTP as the remote protocol. Uh, what this does is it does your authentication over SSH. So it'll check that you're the right person. But then the actual data transfer will be done over unencrypted channels. So you can alternatively use a personal grid certificate uh, for authentication. And this will allows you to use other protocols, such as GSI FTP. Uh, this is not something I have first-hand experience with, but I am in reliably informed that the benefit of this over SSH FTP is some additional authentication of the data screens. While the drawback is it's significantly more complex to set up, uh, there is documentation available online for any of you brave enough to state the challenge. So there's BBCP, which is available as an alternative to grid FTP. Uh, it operates along the same general principles. So it uses SSH authentication and transfers using uh, parallel unencrypted streams. Uh, its uh, standard options are uh, dash H, to, uh, sorry, dash S, dash, dash S to specify the number of streams you want to use. Uh, the default is four, which is usually a good rule of thumb, but the optimal depends on your available network bandwidth, congestion transfer time, server resources, a number of other factors. Uh, one thing to note is more streams will require more memory on both your source and target machines. So it can be fairly easy to run out of memory on your local laptop or even indeed the server by increasing that number too much. So it, it pays to experiment. It depends on sort of your local setup, what the, the perfect amount of streams will be. Um, General advice I've heard is that if you're doing sort of LAN transfers, local stuff, you can get away with larger numbers of streams. But if you're doing WAN over the internet things, you probably want to go lower. Um, dash P is similar to the usual verbose option, except that it has an argument, so this number here, where you provide it with whichever a number of seconds, and it will print out the status of your transfer every every tick number of those seconds. So dash P5 will give you the transfer status every five seconds printed out. And here dash T is not hugely intuitive. So it's the option that you need to use to specify a command to be executed on the remote site, which launches BBCP, uh, since BBCP needs to be running on both source and destination. Um, so we'll just skip to the example to take a look there. So BCP wants two streams and dash T. The argument is SSH user at dtn01.rdf.ac.uk, then module load BBCP, then BBCP. And what this does is it on your local machine, SSHs to the DTN node, you'll need to put in your own user uh, when you use this, that's your Archer credentials. Um, it will prompt for a password or not if you have keys set up. And then, so once it's authenticated and on the DTN node, it executes module load BBCP and then BBCP. So the module load BCP, BCP is executed on the DTN node itself. And that sets up the source and destination uh, link. So, and then you've just got the standard source file and then your destination which uh, includes the DTN domain here. Uh, one thing to note as well is I believe BBCP, you do need to give a name for the destination file. If you leave that blank, it won't work. Um, so that, uh, right, yes, there is a note here as well about assuming the relevant ports are open. So generally, I've found that BBCP can be slightly tricky to actually get to connect. And this is usually due to sort of firewalls, blocking ports, or other networking things in the way. And that's why 
the dash Z option is mentioned here. So what it does is it will reverse your connection direction. So instead of going from source to destination, it'll tell the destination to actually connect to you at the source. And it can sometimes get around some of these firewall issues. Right, so that's the end of the transfer section and the end of the talk in general. So I'll just quickly summarize things here. Uh, you can transfer uh, data to the RDF directly from an Archer login node, or you can go through the DTNs for remote transfer. And uh, what's quite important is to be aware of this metadata bottleneck and how archiving mitigates it. And uh, you should know that there are, there's more than one way to copy data. There's a, a few different methods available, and uh, within them there exists a trade-off between security and performance. And finally, if you ever need advice on the best way forward, uh, you can email the help desk at support at archer.ac.uk and your query will be routed to one of our very clever, highly trained support staff. Or you might end up with me. <laughs> um, so here we go, here's just a few links and references, where you can, and uh, as promised, the link to the grid FTP tools. And that's the final slide. So. I think that's the final, yeah, that's the final slide, so any questions? Is there a question on disk quotas? Yeah, so a question from the chat here asking uh, what quotas are in place. So that sort of disk quotas, that's generally uh, decided by your PI. So when, when they make the project, they will have a, a quota they will usually split that up into groups. And so just repeat the answer really in, in the chat there. Oh yeah, is the, the work quota still disabled? Is that correct? Yeah. That's a temporary thing at the moment though. So there's a, another question there. Uh, is there a way to have rsync-like functionality over grid FTP or BBCP? So you mean things like the the mirroring? Um, I don't believe so, but I couldn't say definitively off the top of my head. There is quite a substantial amount of documentation for good FTP. So the um, yeah the the Globus URL copy utility is not the only utility uh, contained in these Globus tools. It's the one that I have most firsthand experience with. But uh, I, w I wouldn't be surprised if there's a way to get rsync functionality or similar. Uh, but I, c I couldn't tell you off the top of my head. Unless, uh, I'll look to the other people in the room to see if they... Aha, okay. So uh, and I'll repeat that for the sake of the recording. So there are transfer tools such as G-Transfer and G-Satellite which provide functionality like this. And uh, Andy points out that rsync is a wrapper. You can use different protocols under the hood, uh, such as seen with SSH earlier in the talk. So it's not impossible that you could actually use grid FTP from rsync itself. And something we'll look into at a later date. Okay, there's another question there. Is bandwidth to slash from login nodes controlled slash throttled, or is the user's responsibility to be sensible? Uh, there's no throttling as far as I'm aware. There's certainly no bandwidth quotas and things because uh, it's not unheard of to be transferring terabytes of data overnight. That's uh, something you can do. So as far as I know, no. Uh, the limitation is your own connection. So how much bandwidth you can supply. Right, uh, so uh, this question here about recovery point time in the RDF, uh, I, what is the window before data is safely backed up? So the answer is uh, daily snapshots is, uh, is the aim. Uh, but again, uh, I have to say that our disaster recovery is what these backups are for. So accidental deletion is uh, not supported. So that's, uh, that's a good point that 
Andy makes in the chat in that uh, the RDF backups uh, can fall behind uh, in the case where there is a, a large number of files deposited in a single day. And it is number of files which uh, seems to cause the issue rather than the actual size. So uh, archiving is actually a good way to sort that out. If you archive all files before they go to the RDF, so it only has a single file to back up, then the backup process is much more efficient. And I'll uh, just point that we're speaking with the vendor to optimize the backup process. And uh, initial investigations are positive. Uh, I should mention uh, my glamorous assistant, Mark Slipiak, <laughs> will be uh, doing a talk on open foam uh, two weeks from today and how to manage the vast number of files that uh, that, that produces. Uh, thanks all for attending, and uh, our recording will go up with this at a later date.